Wild Adventures. Uh, but one New morning Wampler. in the uh, spring of uh, 2014, I got on the web and I saw a bunch of, uh, I saw a full-on police state in action over in, out in the middle of nowhere, out in uh, Nevada. I saw uh, attack dogs, I saw people being tasered, I saw this lady being uh, thrown to the ground. Uh, and uh, it enraged me so much that uh, about two hours later, I believe it was April 9th, two hours later, I had my car all packed up and I was headed on my way over there. That was the beginning for me of going into action in this cause and uh, I've uh, never looked back. Uh, the experience there uh, was utterly fantastic and uh, I, I'm pretty sure I believe it was the first ever uh, convention and gathering of liberty-minded people uh, in many, many years at least anyway, all of us coming together like that. And it was a real eye-opener and a real inspiration. Of course, we capped it off by a great triumph where we hardly believed even what we had actually done, chased off a bunch of these armed federals and made them hightail it out of there. Uh, I don't think that many people have experienced the exhilaration, uh, exhilaration that we felt uh, later on the day after having uh, done that. We're all kind of well, we were cheering and patting each other on the back. We were also kind of wandering around asking ourselves, what, what do we do? What do we do? What do we do there? Uh, that moment uh, was part of, is part of what has kept me going up to this time. Another part of it, though, was meeting a uh, ranching family that I, quite honestly, had never heard of before. I'd never heard of uh, the Bundy family. I'd never heard of this whole lands issue. I had never heard of how uh, the criminal actions of... Uh, uh, federal agencies like Bureau of Land Management until uh, I went out there to Bundy Ranch. Uh, a very, very compelling thing for me, though, was seeing the absolute courage and determination of, the, of this ranching family. And I have to say, in particular, in the ultimate moment down there, we were facing off uh, the, the armed BLM goons in Tokopwash. A certain man stepped forward and took, care, took control of the situation and instructed the, the BLM guy, I, did, I didn't even know it was, uh, was, uh, was Dan Love at the time, but the lead BLM guy instructed the BLM guy that they had to leave. No question about it. No choice. Go. Of course, that man was Ammon Bundy. Mm -hmm. I was very, very much so impressed by his, uh, I call it, generalship of seizing the moment, seeing the opportunity and the dynamic of that time and stepping into the middle of it and taking charge. Uh, I was very, very impressed by that, and of course, uh, that impression of him uh, has uh, only increased. Uh, uh, my estimation of him has only only increased to this day, uh, and other things, experience we've uh, had. Uh, I will say that uh, uh, having ending up being uh, on trial in Portland, along with Emma and Ryan and Shauna, Jeff, Kenny, and David, was the proudest moment of my life, and that was regardless of whatever the verdict was came out. Whatever the verdict was, it was still the proudest moment of my life. And uh, I witnessed there another side of Ammon, his uh, composure, and I call it grace under fire, uh, when he's being questioned by the prosecution when he was on the witness stand. And he was, uh, in a way, kind of amusing because he frustrated them absolutely every time they tried to corner him in any kind of their long rigmarole they're trying to run out. And actually, he uh, stopped the prosecutor Gabriel dead in his tracks <laughs> one time. That was really, really funny, really funny. And very impressive, too. Uh, since then, I say, I have not been able to resist the call for uh, uh, other actions like at the Sugar Pine Mine or uh, Malheur. And uh, quite honestly, uh, even though I was arrested for uh, the charges there uh, and transported up to uh, Portland to uh, stand trial, quite honestly, uh, I would have I would have been up there regardless of anything, you know, and if they, if, if Judge Brown had simply issued me a summon, summons saying, show up in Portland for trial, I would have been there anyway, because uh, there's nowhere else I was going to be in this world, except where uh, Abbott and Ryan Bundy were and the other people were on trial. Uh, as you all know, the result of that was another great triumph, and uh, uh, another moment that a very, very few people have ever experienced. Uh, a little more delving into history here. And I have to refer to Emma's most recent talk, 
right. where he nice. describes the problem we are facing today and also prescribes the solution. The problem, of course, is these federal agents, out of control federal agencies that are present in our, in our states and localities. What to do about them? For my personally, I think it is absolutely futile and useless to go back to Washington, D.C. and complain about it. It will never happen. We'll never resolve the problem by doing it that way. There are other self-perpetuating uh, agencies that uh, will uh, keep going for their own benefit indefinitely until basically somebody stops them, not in Washington, D.C., but in the locations where they are operating. That was the second part of what Anna was talking about, the solution, and that is uh, local control and authority in, in our localities and our state. Uh, this is rooted very strongly in American history, and it has only been in the last perhaps uh, century or so, or perhaps less than that, that the uh, oppressive nature of the federal government has, has expanded more and more, uh, and self-aggrandized itself more and more over the country. We're all pretty much aware now of the, the uh, states that were admitted after the Civil War that have uh, very, very little of their own uh, territory under their own control. Uh, most of you know about it now. It, uh, it, it sounds pretty ridiculous that, that uh, say, Nevada, the state of Nevada actually only has actual control over, what, 15, 20 percent of the land within their state? There are many other aspects to that, uh, the federal control, too. Uh, but I want to briefly, at least, uh, give a uh, <coughs> recap of how uh, the original relationship was between the, our, the central government and the states. You know, I have a little trick question that I ask uh, people, and that is, where did the federal government come from? <laughs> How was it created? Which usually stumps most people. And the simple answer to that is that the federal government was created by the state. <coughs> At the end of the Revolutionary War, uh, these 13 separate sovereign and independent countries, which is quite literally, that's what they were. These, these sovereign and independent countries had uh, gone through a number of years where it was to their benefit to band together and help each other. They had a more or less a gentleman's agreement called the Articles Confederation that was pretty much based on voluntary participation and contribution by all these 13 states. But like so many situations, uh, once the war was over, once the threat is gone, and these people had been banding together for their own benefit, uh, they started going their own separate ways. The threat is gone. You can say you take it in a community where a number of people band together to fight off a bunch of uh, a gang people or something like that, and they are willing to sacrifice uh, some of their own personal per uh, prerogatives in order to win this fight for the common good. But what happens when the fight is over with? Then everybody says, okay, great. Now we're, we're going to go back our, go on our separate ways again. Uh, this is pretty much the situation that developed after the Revolutionary War. The uh, various states, they had been united, that's correctly, very loosely though. The various states uh, uh, found that with the threat gone, the willingness to cooperate between themselves had uh, started to, to evaporate. What had not evaporated, though, was the presence of very predatory, large, powerful nations on the North American continent. Both Spain, France, and England had large territories in North America, and they continued to be a threat to those, that little crust of what was the United States at the time along the eastern seaboard. Many people saw that a continued cooperation and banding together was necessary to uh, uh, protect us against these threats, and for a number of other reasons, too. With the war over, uh, things like uh, boundary and boundary disputes between the different states started re-emerging again. Uh, Trade disputes and tariff disputes started reemerging again. Uh, the crazy, crazy quilt patchwork of different monetary systems in all these different states was a definite, dis, definite, uh, definite disadvantage to uh, to commerce. Uh, 
there were a number of things there that uh, a number that made a number of people see that uh, some stronger form of central government that the, all the different sovereign states would agree to was necessary. The primary one, of course, was securing our borders and self-defense. Uh, as things stood uh, at the end of the Revolutionary War, it was very possible that some state, whatever, Georgia or uh, North Carolina or New York or Pennsylvania, may simply make a foreign treaty to the disadvantage of the other states. And uh, they uh, would start operating on their own as a, uh, the, 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 the sovereign country they were, uh, say to and, and start dissolving and uh, the, uh, whatever alliances they were have between the different states. Uh, George Washington, James Madison, John Adams, and a number of others came to be called the uh, Federalists because they were promoting a, uh, some, a stronger central government in some form to make foreign treaties, to regulate these uh, tariff disputes between the states, uh, to formulate a uh, uniform monetary system, uh, to have an army and a navy. Uh, it, it's strange to us to think now, but each one of these, prior to then, each one of these sovereign independent states had their own army and navy. The pretty dinky little outfits they were, for sure. It's doubtful whether uh, the army of uh, Massachusetts could take on the, the, uh, the British army. <laughs> uh, after a number of different conferences uh, uh, in the mid-1780s, uh, uh, our founders kind of more or less backed their way into having a convention in Philadelphia in 1787. And I, and I don't use that term lightly. They backed their way into it. <laughs> It was, came to be seen that a number of these problems that had been arising, say, between Maryland and, uh, gosh, let's see, what's the other place, in Virginia, uh, about trade disputes, tariff disputes, and things like this, were pretty much en endemic uh, over uh, the, the entire Union. And that it was probably a good idea to have a convention to sort it all out. Uh, state delegates were sent, some of them highly suspicious of the proceedings, that were definitely true. Uh, Patrick Henry said uh, uh, when he heard of the, the, what came to be called the Constitutional Convention, we'll call it the Federal Convention or the Philadelphia Convention. Patrick Henry, when he, when he heard of it, he said, I smell a rat. <laughs> of course, he was an anti-federalist. He was perfectly happy to keep continue on with a very loose confederation. What I'm trying to get at here is that the uh, Constitution that was formulated in uh, the, the the summer of 1787 was written and agreed upon by the states. They're the ones that created it. They, they, they created the founding charter of the central government. <clears throat> it was all not an easy process. Uh, three of the potential deal breakers that had to be found solutions for were the uh, disposition of the western lands, which some of the states that had large, large land holdings out west uh, were not too happy about. Uh, this, the snake under the table, slavery, and also uh, main, main bone of contention, the method of representation in Congress. I won't go into detail on a lot of those, except to say they were all resolved uh, one way or another. The, the slavery issue they kicked down the road by just saying that no more slaves could be imported into the United States after 1808. What I want to stress here is that this Constitution, issue, finally issued by the uh, Philadelphia Convention, was had no effect. It was not law. It had no legal, uh, no legal power behind it whatsoever. It was simply a proposal that was issued out to the states for their consideration. It would have no effect until the states agreed to it. When the states called. Uh, ratifying conventions and the, and the ratifying convention of each individual state agreed to sign on and ratify the Constitution. Uh, more or less arbitrarily, the uh, number of states required was settled on as nine, nine out of the 13. But we can take Rhode Island off the board completely because they boycotted the, boycotted the Constitutional Convention. It didn't have anything to do with it. 
it's a funny story because uh, uh, when the union was finally established and Washington was elected president, he made a tour around the a tour around the United States. But when he came at that time, Rhode Island had still not ratified the Constitution, had still not joined the Union. And when uh, Washington came to the uh, border of Rhode Island, he stopped and went around it. <laughs> like a slap in the face, guys. You know, I'm not going into your foreign country. What I'm getting at here is these, this Constitution had to be agreed to by the states. Once again, the states are creating this charter. They're, the states are creating this federal government. And uh, they did not do it so that the federal government would become their master. As many of you know, uh, there was a considerable amount of doubt about uh, the whole idea of forming this central government. After all, our founders had been through this fought a terrible war to throw off an oppressive, powerful government. And the idea of creating another one here uh, seemed pretty scary and pretty doubtful to a lot of them. For those who were promoting the uh, signing of this uh, founding charter uh, wrote, uh, I, think, I believe with it, James Madison, John Adams, and, so, and John Jay wrote what you've all heard of, the Federalist Papers, which were a basically a sales pitch for ratifying the Constitution. They assuaged people's fears about what this government would be like by describing how, uh, how controlled it would be, how it would have very, very discreet and defined powers. But you know, <clears throat> it didn't succeed. Despite all the persuasion of the Federalists, there was still a considerable amount of sentiment in the country that made it appear that the proposed charter would fail. There would be no federal government as we understand it now. <clears throat> Finally, James Madison promised solemnly that if the state, con state uh, ratifying conventions would go ahead and ratify this, uh, this Constitution and join on, agree to it, that at the very, very first U.S. Congress, more amendments would be added to the Constitution that would spell out in black and white uh, declaratory and restrictive clauses that would apply to the federal government. It would tell the federal government what it had to do and what it absolutely could not do. <clears throat> this, of course, as we are familiar with, is the, uh, the first ten amendments to the Constitution. Actually, about approximately when the <clears throat> amendment phase came in the very first U.S. Congress, about 180 prospective amendments were, were submitted by the different states. They'd all had their own declarations of right prior to this. Excuse me. <clears throat> In a nutshell, this Bill of Rights is uh, to prevent abuse by the federal government. And I'll do one single quotation here to illustrate that, and that is the preamble to the Bill of Rights. The preamble, of course, explains what the first ten amendments are for, their purpose, and everything like that. And here it is. The conventions of a number of the states, having at the time of their adopting the Constitution, expressed a desire in order to prevent misconstruction or abuse of its power, that further declaratory and restrictive clauses be added, and as extending the ground of public confidence in the government, will best ensure its beneficent institution. Now there it is right there. Th these first 10 amendments are aimed at and apply to the federal government, and they tell it what it absolutely has to do, like jury trials and due process, and they tell it what it absolutely has, absolutely has to keep its hands off of, like messing with our guns. Well, let's go on down to number 10. Now, that's the one we're uh, important now today. And it's the one that uh, Ammon was referring to, although he never said it specifically. The 10th Amendment. The power is not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively, or to the people. This is the constitutional and peacefully, peaceful, constitutionally supported remedy to our problems today with the federal government. Having an actual geographic location, a place in this country where a state, where uh, the state government tells the federal government that no, you, these things you're trying to do are not one of your delegated powers. We're not having it and uh, we're going to stop you. 
please leave. <laughs> Tough assignment? Well, <coughs> yes, it is. Uh, there's obviously uh, the uh, monetary losses that would occur when uh, uh, state opposition to uh, federal control is, is implemented. But we have to realize uh, and weigh the stakes we're playing for here now. As we have seen, this federal government has become absolutely out of control, tyrannical, cavalier, and a fraud, misconstruction, and abuse have become, it, it's the federal government's standard operating procedure. It has become an all-consuming monster, and our choices now are whether to stop it somehow, hopefully in a peaceful manner, hopefully in a way that preserves our, our, our Republican form of government, but we have to stop it somehow. <laughs> The assertion, firm assertion of these 10th Amendment prerogatives that states have is the peaceful solution to do it. And if people can weigh whether they would not have their children be subjects and still have their ski boat, or maybe give up the ski boat and that wise green TV <laughs> and have liberty in their state, uh, that's, I think, the, the solution that it will come down to. As Ammon had said, uh, the solution is uh, assertion of <clears throat> local and state uh, autonomy. Uh, it's the way out of all this problem here. And uh, that has been at the core of uh, what we've been doing for a number of years here at Bundy Ranch, Sugar Pine, Malheur, and everything else. If you notice, every single one of those instances was a, was a case where the federal government was, was, act, was, was acting out of hand. Uh, hopefully, this can be done by a simple, well, relatively simple, Hopefully it can be done, but by, by done I mean uh, putting the federal government in its place and restoring the proper relationship between the states and the federal government. Hopefully it can be done in a peaceful, orderly manner. But I'm afraid it's going to take some quite assertive action by uh, people uh, to get it started at least anyway. Uh, that's about all I have now. Uh, as you all know, we are in a terrific fight here. <coughs> In, uh, in Las Vegas, and, uh, it appears that uh, a criminal case based on fraud, lies, and uh, deception is falling apart, as it justly should. We just have to keep pressing on. So, thank you. Thank you. I think it's yeah, a great no, it's, time to take a you. break. And we've got great refreshments that have been provided by Wendy in the back. And uh, we also have to just, uh, you know, let everybody who smokes get a smoke break and that kind of thing. We'll be back in five minutes. Okay. Thanks. <laughs>